pushing buttons and pulling triggers. This is Gun Funny. Welcome to Gun Funny episode 100. Today I'm going to chat with Corinne Mosier, John Napolitano, Eric and Chad from Iraq Veteran 8888, and Mr. Guns and Gear. I am your host, Ava Flanell, and today's show is going to be a little different as we are celebrating episode 100. Excellent. Awesome. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. All right, so we are going to do the show a little bit differently, but before I get into it, I want to talk about Manicore Arms. Do any of you guys have any experience with any Manicore Arms products? I do. I have a ton of their AK stuff. It's been solid oh, nice. over the years. Yeah. What what kind of products do you have from them? Uh, they're forens and muzzle devices mostly, I believe. They're muzzle devices I love. I have, let's see, what do I have? I have their triangle stock. I have a lot of their muzzle devices. They make some really solid products. If you guys want to check them out, go to manicorearms.com. Use the code GUNFUNNY15, and that gets you 15% off. All right, so let's get into it. So we're doing the show a little bit differently. I'm going to start off by asking you guys just a series of questions. I want to start by just kind of asking you guys, how have things changed since the last time that you were on the show? And, John, I'm going to start with you. Okay. So the last time we spoke, I didn't have a gun license. It was uh, unlawfully taken. Since then, first they called me up and they told me that they were going to give me my license back, but they had to come to my house to inspect my safe. So I basically said no and hung up on them. And my uh, my lawyer called and said, it's going to be a real difficult you know, in court why you won't let them look at your safe. My thing is, if you're not looking at everyone else's safe, I don't think it's fair that you look at mine. So... Under protest, I let him look at my safe. I have two Liberty safes. They're, they're ginormous. And uh, the guy's like, you need biometric. I was like, yeah, biometrics is failed technology. I, I will never get a biometrics. He's like, well, they will never give you a license. I'm like, great, back to court we go. I'm like, you're just helping my case, man. And then the next day they called me up and they're like, we thought about it and uh, your safe is adequate. So they, they gave me uh, my target license back. I went down to get it and I'm like, hey, I want to apply for a full carry. Guys, like, there's 30 people on Long Island that have a. Uh, he said, actually, there's 29 people on Long Island that have a full carry. Great, I'll be 30. I'm like, hand me the paperwork, please. So he's like, you're never gonna get it. I'm like, are you refusing to hand me the paperwork? So they handed it to me. I stapled the packet from my lawyer, gave it back to him. I was basically like, I, I dare you not to give it to me. I'm gonna have 30 days. Then I filed an Article 78. I left. 29 days, called back, and they're like, yep, we'll have it ready for you tomorrow. And I went and picked it up, and now I have a full carry in New York. Wow. And then what is going on with the lawsuit? So the lawsuit still goes. There's two cases coming up, and I, I don't know the names of them off the top of my head. But there's two lawsuits that are um, in line with what I'm suing them for. So if those two cases win, mine's going to be a slam dunk. Yeah. So we're just waiting. You know, There's just an order of things, and they happen to be coming before me. So hopefully those two cases do well. I, I still told the DA that I would drop the charges. Uh, I'll drop the charges. I'll, I'll drop the lawsuit if they um, change the law where, you know, right now they can take your stuff for any reason. So if someone calls up and says, John and I had an argument, I want you to go take his guns. They'll be here in 15 minutes and they'll take my shit. They'll tell me it's six months minimum. At six months, they tell you it'd be about a year. At a year, they tell you it's a year and a half. And there's no due process. So what I'm trying to change is, I don't think I'll ever change the fact where if someone calls, they're going to come to your house and take your stuff. But I think they have 30 days is is really realistic where they got to come up with some proof or let me stand before a judge. Let that judge say, hey, you can't have your guns back. You know, I I don't want to hear it from a cop. I want to hear it from a judge. I I want the due process. Even if I was involved in a crime with my gun, I would still get due process. So it's amazing that here I am. I've never committed a crime. I've never been charged with anything, and I still was denied due process to get my stuff back. Mm-hmm. Chad and Eric, has anything changed since the last time you guys have been on the show? Not a whole lot. I mean, your hair's grown quite a bit. Well, yeah, I mean, that happens when you don't cut it. I lost my scissors. so. And Eric finally went to the dentist. I did. It's been quite a while. But I'm proud to say I'm now harder and plaque free. <laughs> and, uh, it's a new life for me now. 
<laughs> yeah, but you said you have a cavity, right? You have to get a filling. Yeah, I'm gonna have to have a filling, but you know, all that dark chocolate rum. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess it could be worse. <laughs> No, it, it's been good. You know, we've just been staying really busy. You know, the channel's been doing pretty well. I mean, despite all of YouTube's crap, it's funny. Even even while we were just on this uh, chat here hanging out, I checked my phone and YouTube pulled one of my videos literally just a few minutes ago. And it was a, a video of us reloading Martini Henry ammo, like obsolete ammo for an obsolete rifle that's been out of production for 140 years. But somehow it's a really big deal. And, you know, false mass destruction in the world. They had to pull that video for the children. So, hi, man. Can't catch a break sometimes. I know. Mike, you've, ex you've been experiencing a lot of that lately. Yeah. But that's really not changed since the last time we talked. So it's been pretty yeah. consistent. <laughs> so, yeah, they, they basically just auto-demonetize everything, which is fine. And actually, I've been testing for all the other YouTube folks out there just not monetizing videos at all lately. And those seem to be performing better, oddly enough, because they're getting a higher discovery rate. So I was trying to figure out the algorithm one way or another. Hmm. So basically, I'm in luck then because I don't have enough subscribers to monetize my channel. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I'm winning somehow. Corinne, what about you? Has anything changed? Since I just looked back to see the date that we, we were on was March 12th. And since March 12th, I have been so busy and there are a ton of shows, a ton of teaching. Uh, thankfully, I've been able to, to make it to a couple matches. Um, most memorable recent match was my first team match in Texas at Reverly Peak Ranch. And it was for the DC project, um, which I don't know if I talked to you about the DC project last time in March, but um, we are a grassroots, grassroots organization, 50 women, one from every state. And we go to Washington, D.C. every year in the summer. And we basically meet with our representatives and share the faces and voices of real Second Amendment supporters, women specifically, because our stories and are very powerful. So that match um, was a ton of fun. My teammate was Ben Jurassic from Texas, and we kicked some serious butt. And, but mostly it was just, it was just a ton of fun. So I've never shot a format like that. I've shot just individual sport, you know, shooting three gun, but this was like, we got to play off each other's strengths. I slipped up. He was strong. Sometimes we both slipped up. It was, it was a lot of fun, but I mean, I've been, I traveled to California uh, to visit Taryn. We got to meet some uh, really cool folks at his ranch and train them, including, oh goodness, I can't remember what his name is, but um a, a couple a couple of the actors out there and one of them joe gatt is in the new dumbo movie and he was really cool he was also in what's that um what's that show anyways it, it doesn't matter but uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter but all that means nothing because now i'm on a podcast with uh john snow so that's cool <laughs> nice hey um, also went to nra i went to uscca and taught some training courses with instructor zero at us in pittsburgh and he's planning on doing a lot more U.S. this year. He's got a special training training program that he's launching that's, I don't think, super secret still, but I, I won't bring it up yet. Last month, I went to Missouri and was part of the um, NOC, No Other Choice training event, a train and learn event for uh, industry influencers, instructors, and it was mostly for me a networking thing. I was able to uh, give about an hour and a half of instruction um, and it was, it was just a ton of fun, but I met people from around the country that I never would have met in my circles of competition. And so I'm, I'm very blessed and grateful for that opportunity, Kevin. Thank you for that. If you, if you watch this. Um, and then I went to the Hornady uh, zombies in the heartland match. I do uh, shoot for Hornady and uh, that's always fun. Zombies in the heartland was my first three gun match in 2014. It's kind of tra a tradition. Uh, my, very first instructor here in Kansas, uh, and I always travel down there and shoot it together. So it's a it's a nostalgic thing, and it's lots of fun. So that's I, ugh, I can keep on talking because it's been a busy, 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 busy spring and summer. I know I always see like all of your posts on social media, and it seems like you're definitely keeping busy, Mike. I didn't mean to like skip over you. So <laughs> what have you done? Is there has anything changed? Um, I realized I after that I was like I didn't even let you answer. It's all good. I guess I could think of the big thing was travel wise anyway, as I went up to uh, Smith and Wesson did a tour of the factory video will be coming out there just blessing off on the ITAR portion of it now. So I don't normally let anyone review my videos before they go up, but when there's like laws and stuff involved, I, I let it slide. 
So nice. Very cool. And when did you do that? Um, beginning of the month. And uh, what was interesting about that was uh, when I was a kid, well, probably 30 or more years ago now at this point, um, I actually toured the factory with Boy Scouts. They used to have it somewhat open to the public. It's not. It hasn't been since 9-11. But it was very interesting because I didn't grow up with guns unlike a lot of people uh, on this, you know, platform right now. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know I didn't know anything about it when I went through as a kid. It was just something to do. And then now with what I know and the understanding of everything uh just to see the difference in how i perceived everything was kind of interesting for me very nice i want to talk about just some of the political stuff going on in the industry such as the nra eric chad i know you guys are pretty active and you're always posting stuff about the nra what are your guys' thoughts now just i mean really a lot has kind of unfolded this last year eric oh, well, the, the situation <laughs> has certainly become a dumpster fire and it seems like people are just running for cover and, and just trying to separate themselves from the organization as quickly as possible. I mean, we see that Chris Cox, uh, well, they, he, he says he resigned, that I, he was put on administrative leave. And then obviously everybody's really calling for Wayne LaPierre to get out of there. Uh, Marion Hammer, many of the FUDs in the NRA that are just causing a lot of trouble because they're just wasteful, you know, and that's the, the big situation. And we probably, you know, equal flash and praise for, for our position on, you know, being hard on the NRA. But, you know, we, we feel like over the years they've, they've definitely weakened the Second Amendment, not strengthened it. And I know that's kind of a weird thing to say because it just seems that, you know, a lot of people think of the NRA is like this just this group that it's just immovable and, and that you can't do anything wrong and everything like that. But if you look back at the history of the NRA and what they've actually done and the, the measures that they've supported, uh, they've actually done quite a bit to erode our rights. And I, I think that a lot of that has just come from a lot of this lobbying money and and almost the, the government stature that they've sort of uh, postured themselves as is almost an individual little government, a, a bureaucracy all in their own regard and almost untou uh, untouchable in a way. And I think when an organization gets like that, uh, they hemorrhage money in all the wrong places and they don't put the money in the places that it needs to be put in which is, you know, ILA and education, building ranges, training our youth, getting the you know, young sports shooters involved, getting ladies involved uh, in, the, in the entire context of the Second Amendment. And I believe they've really failed uh, gun owners in that regard uh, in, in terms of not, you know, putting the money where it's going to do the most good. Instead, we're buying $40,000 worth of suits and going on $180,000 trips to Europe and, you know, getting houses for uh, interns that cost, you know, $5,000, $6,000 a night. I mean, that's just wasteful spending. It's a, a wasteful situation that we've allowed to occur. And I'm glad to see it finally, hope, hoping that the members are going to, you know, take the reins and fix the situation and get all of these FUDs and wasteful people out of leadership positions and start to put it back on the right track. Mm -hmm. I agree. Hey, can I ask you a question? I agree with everything you said, but if everybody, every, every gun owner in the U.S. joined the NRA, would they be the most powerful organization in the world? I mean, would they then not need the lobbyists and then they could do more for us? Is it a money issue? Do they need more members? Well, you know, what's interesting is there's only a small microcosm of gun owners that are a, me a member of the NRA. Correct. And NRA membership is like 5 million people. When you consider there's about 100 million gun owners in the United States. Yeah. So you're talking what 5% of the entire, entire microcosm of gun owners are only are members of the NRA. So what that kind of then becomes is does that mean that the organization's out of touch because they're not appealing to the people that are gun owners across the country? Or is it the fact that the gun owners that are out there at large aren't worried about it until it comes to the doorstep, like you were talking about, right? Yeah. Red flag or confiscation or some issue where you can have your rights taken away, your guns taken away with no due process. Or, or do we have a huge group of people that are just going to wait for them to come to the front door before they do anything about it? Or maybe some people are just indifferent and they don't care. It hasn't gotten bad enough yet. You know what I mean? The situation hasn't gotten so bad that people – are, are starving over the issue. You know what I mean? People are fat and comfortable. They've got their internet. They've got their, you know, Facebook and social media and all the distractions. You know, to worry about it. They're well fed. There's, there's milk and bread in the stores. There's gas in the pumps. 
no one's hurting, no one's suffering. So for a lot of people, it's probably just not enough of an issue yet. Yeah, I think that people who aren't members really don't have any any uh, any voice. They they shouldn't even be allowed to complain about it. I mean, I, I'm a member. I don't agree with everything they do, so I definitely do some complaining. But I feel like if all the gun owners got together and, and joined the NRA, I think then we could do we could make real change. Even if 50, percent you know, it's such a small think, fraction. I don't really know if that would really solve much. Like what the problem is? Well, there'd right be no now. more lobbying, right? We don't need any more money. So nobody would be able to lobby against us. They, they, they wouldn't be able to give the NRA money and get something for it. Mm -hmm. I think the problem also is like, if you, if you go to like the NRA, like Facebook page, there's so many people that are still supporting the NRA that aren't aware of like the corruption that's going on within the organization. Yeah. And they purposely turn to one. That's the thing is, you know, they're, they're trying to just let the dumpster fire burn down sweep it under the rug and they're hoping that people just forget about it and the people that are ignorant to the fact will be none the wiser. And of course, they're really angry at people like me because obviously we're costing them their bottom dollar is suffering at, as a result of people like me who are speaking out against their, you know, transcrepancies against us. And, you know, they've been very wasteful with money and very wasteful with funds. And we have a, a board of what is it, 76 members as a board size that is designed to fail, it, it, it is purposely designed to be inefficient, not transparent. OK, and when you you combine all of those things with waste and a hierarchy of financial ruism that doesn't involve the lower peons, then it almost becomes sort of like a pyramid scheme in a way mm -hmm. it's being ran like an organized crime syndicate is what it's being ran. At. It really is. Yeah. And I think that as more uh, information comes out and more documents are released, more formal employees begin to talk and, and all of these things start to come to light. I think we're going to we're going to quite frankly see that it, it's really like a mafia level organized crime deal. You know, it really is the way it's being ran. The, I mean, I mean, away, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly a lot of problems with it. I, I agree with most of what you said there, Eric. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, the pro-freedom, pro-liberty gun owner in America that is informed anyway, isn't going to support the NRA until Wayne's gone. I think that's sort of one of those things that's a black and white issue for a lot of folks out there. Now, again, there's other people that have done some things that are not on the path toward uh, greater freedom and liberty, um, but he is just a poster child for it at this point. I'd say that if you wanted to put your money in any organization right now, it'd be the Firearms Policy Coalition and Gun Owners of America, two organizations that actually fight for our rights instead of giving us red flag laws, giving us a bump stock ban, and supporting those things. Along like with Eric said, the, the NRA has supported just about every major anti-gun piece of legislation in the past, what, 80 years? So I, I wouldn't say that giving them any more money via new memberships you know, the other 95,000 plus gun owners in the in the country is going to do any good because they're mismanaging the money that they have right now. So if they were actually spending the money as they should and actually lobbying and fighting on Washington or in Washington and then on the state level as well, then we wouldn't be seeing some of the problems that we're seeing nowadays. It's just all a, a big power grab. You know, they get that little taste of power and they want more of it. And it's just it's a money problem. So more members isn't going to do it, but changing the, I guess, the image of the organization is the big thing with, with us. And, you know, people like Tim of our Military Arms Channel and many other people in social media realm is just getting that image to a point where it represents all gun owners. If you're a gun owner, you should support all gun rights, not just your your particular little facet. You know, it's like, oh, well, I don't care about ARs because I'm just I'm just a hunter. Well, I'm a hunter, so I should care about everybody's gun rights. But there's people out there in in our group, in the Second Amendment group, that are kind of infighting. And we've seen that in the past couple of years. And it's just, it's been eye-opening. It really has, because we never knew that kind of stuff existed before. It's just crazy. But that's just my personal opinion. I'm going to stop you guys for a second. And we're going to take a break to hear from my advertiser, Sportsman's Guide. 
So Sportsman's Guide, if you guys aren't familiar with them, I like to call it the Amazon of the outdoor world. They have all kinds of stuff, I mean, including, you know, firearms, firearm accessories. But in addition to that, they also have a bunch of gear for camping, boating, hunting, gardening, you name it, anything that involves the outdoors, they have it. Head on over to sportsmansguide.com and uh, tell them that I said hi. Um, all right. So I'm going to change the subject a little bit. So what is something you guys have done that no one would expect? Hmm. <laughs> right. I'll take this one. Okay. So I was asking Mike and uh, he was saying something that I've done that people wouldn't expect that I've done is help slaughter and butcher pigs, or hogs. Our friends have a, uh, have a farm out in Oskaloosa, Kansas, and we sometimes eat their bacon and their pork and their sausage and, a uh, couple times we've been out there and did the whole process from, you know, feeding them, shooting them, hanging them up, draining them, power washing them, it, everything to putting them on the kitchen counter and chopping them up and then eating the bacon. So that's something I've done. I think it's pretty cool. Hmm. Anyone else? I don't know. It's, it's so weird. Like, you know, sometimes you just want to look at the way you live and being so pedestrian. Like we're so used to it, you know what I mean? That. Sometimes it's kind of hard to like nail down, you know, a, a particular thing that you can point to in that way. Yeah. I mean, maybe a lot of people don't know I'm a musician, but that's not really exciting. That's just, I like music, but that's about it, really. Or that you went like 15 years without getting your teeth cleaned. But I guess maybe they may or may not expect <laughs> that. <laughs> well, I'm a grunt. I'm sure Mike understands. Yeah, you only went when you were class four, right? Yeah, but but yeah, I don't have anything exciting, truly. Yeah. All right. Well, then, what about this? What's in the trunk of your car right now? What's not in the what? trunk of my car right now? Are you living rubber in rubber dummies? A rubber dummy, you said. Yeah, a lot of them. Okay, well, that's better than some bodies, right? <laughs> I guess. Hmm. Is it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, so I'll go with mine. I have a truck, so I don't really have a trunk. So uh, we have storage, though, in the back of the uh, seat. So I'm trying to think there's an IFAC in there, like three extra tourniquets. Uh, there is a cooler bag uh, in case we're transporting food, some tie-down strap, recovery equipment for the truck, and AR-15 is back there. And then yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. Oh, yeah, and then like reflective uh, triangles in case you're broken down. In oh, what state are what state do you live in? North Carolina. Can I you, go back back and forth with South and North Carolina. We have landed both. Okay, so are you able to transport a loaded long gun? Yes. In your okay, because here in Colorado you cannot do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No and there, here yeah. It, it, in North Carolina, it's actually weird. In North Carolina, it has to be displayed, <laughs> not concealed, and then in South Carolina, it's concealed. Interesting. What about anybody else? Uh, usually there's a bunch of three gun equipment in the back of mine, but we cleared everything out to go camping. So now all that's back there is my uh, range tactical three gun cart. So it's collapsed right now, but um, I plan on putting my, uh, my Hornady AR rapid safe back there. Nice. So it fits perfectly. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I'm like Mike. I've, I've got a truck. I don't have like, I guess a car like you prefer, but in, in uh in the back of my truck, I've got one of those Lear lockers. I think Mike's seen it before. You know, I have, like, yeah. come down. And it's kind of neat. And it, it's like sometimes ends up being like a catch-all for all kind of random stuff. But I would say like in the back of my truck under my camper top is usually like a half a case of beer, a couple of deer blinds. You know, usually I, I keep like several shirts and coats because you never know. Like, I don't know. I have this weird thing like if someone gets cold, I want to be able to make sure they can get warm and I keep blankets. In the back of my truck, I usually keep like a case of water back there. And there's always like two or three cases of random ammo like, floating around back there, like sleeve, 175 grain max teams, uh, 308. And then I think there's like a case of 338 ammo back there. But uh, yeah, there's always some random ammo. I'm trying to think of what's not in my truck. I've got a truck too with a ton you cover. And we go to the range all the time to film and whatnot. So I keep like all the essentials back there and then things that you wouldn't even think about. But I've got a tray with lead wipes, baby wipes, sunblock, bug spray, all those kind of essentials. I usually keep range bags back there with all kinds of stuff in there, cooler with water or other adult beverages. 
uh, let's see, live radar, other shooting equipment, mats. And then I've got a big old toolbox that I keep with, basically stocked with all the fluids from my trucks and various tools, spark plug wrench, a few other odds and ends. Because Eric, as Eric would say, I drive a old Ford, so it's, you know, found on road dead, that sort of thing. So, but pretty much just that routine stuff, probably four or 500 extra pounds of equipment back there, just in case somebody needs something at the range or if I need to fix something on the road or whatever the case may be, just all kinds of random stuff. It's kind of a catch all like Eric said. Your uh, hairdo stuff in there as well. Oh, my, uh, I got the fair faucet spray, like Steve from stranger things, three squirts. That's it. Don't tell anybody. For some reason, I can't I can't remember, movie, but uh, what's that movie where it's like, no offense, it's like hillbillies and they move from like, I don't know, some some town to like California or something, but they have their truck packed up with all of their stuff and it's like... Come on, yeah, Ava, that's, that's the Beverly really Hillbillies. Come yeah. on, Ava. <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what I'm picturing your truck looking like right now. No, not quite that bad. It's nice and clean, new tires, new brakes. It's all flashy. It's ready to go to Florida, so... <laughs> Nice. Why are you guys going to Florida? Or are you guys all going? Are you going together? Yeah, Eric and I are leaving next week. So nice. Fishing. Very cool. What, yeah, kind, of fishing fishing do? Fishing what kind of fishing do you do? Intercoastal, um, saltwater. Yeah. So it's fun. Actually, I always enjoyed fishing. What gun laws have passed in your area that you find absolutely ridiculous? I mean, obviously, I feel like any gun law is going to be ridiculous, but. Anything specific that's passed in your area? Well, in New York, I know this is not for you guys, but having a gun is still a privilege, not a right. And you sign a document that says they could take it at any time for any reason, which I, I think is just absurd. Yeah. And when you, when you go down to pistol, they tell you it's a privilege, not a right. So still mind boggling to me. <clears throat> That is insane. We don't have anything like that here. Um, it was proposed about two weeks ago. So in North Carolina, anyway, I don't not not so much South Carolina, but North Carolina, they still have a lot of uh, Jim Crow laws that are hanging around. Basically, the ones that didn't offend people, they they're still in law. So, for instance, uh, you have to get if you don't have a concealed carry permit, you have to get a permit to buy a pistol in North Carolina. And of course, the lineage of that, the historical lineage, is that if you were black you walked into the sheriff's office they would deny it so uh, but the process still exists so we still have that law on the books here uh, two weeks ago it was proposed in our, our state house that they would make essentially uh carry permits to be the exact same way so what i mean by that in plain language is that a pistol purchase permit in north carolina is may issue meaning that it's at the discretion of the chief law enforcement officer uh, whereas currently a concealed carry permit is shall issue so they've proposed, uh, the legislators here have proposed uh, to make concealed carry permits may issue as well. Now we have a Democrat uh, governor and our house is majority Republicans. However, several Republicans are actually agreeing to it. So we'll see what happens there. I'm watching it, but nothing permanent has happened yet. So we'll in, in New York, not only do you need a permit, but every, I don't know if you guys can see that, every gun I have, is on all these cards that I have to carry around front and back. So my gun license is like three credit cards. Every gun, every serial number, every caliber, every barrel length. If I take a Glock 22 and put a conversion barrel in, I'm supposed to go down to the police station, tell them I converted it to a nine. Wow. And then every time you add to that list, you just have to get more cards. So yeah, you go you go down, you pay 10 bucks, they tear up your license or they, they shred these and they give you a new one. So my next gun will put me on my fourth card. Wow. That's amazing. ridiculous. And so I think that this stuff's important because everyone always thinks that they live in, you know, states that don't have strict laws. But I mean, a lot of these states tend to set the presence for, you know, for future states. I mean, just look at California. Everyone's like, oh, we should just cut California off and like whatever, you know, but there's a lot of pro gun people in California. Um, it's just... You know, it's just not working in their favor. But people don't realize that this could happen in their states. Oh, yeah. So, Ava, I, I feel like when I hear the other people, sorry, when I hear the people's stories uh, from around the country and I compare it to mine, I, I, I see what you're saying where people in free free states, like I feel yeah. like Kansas, Kansas is just, I mean, I'm sitting here like going, 
where do you guys live? I mean, I, I, I can't relate to you guys. This is yeah. horrific for me to listen to. And, you know, but, but I feel like there's this, there's this middle and my state is going more towards freedom. Sometimes we pull back just a little bit, but then we all, it seems to me like we're always gaining slowly, but states like California, I mean, and, and, and New York, I guess you guys are going the opposite direction. So what, yeah. what is this? It's like geographic. Um, it's just doing this. So, I mean, I, I just, I really can't complain. I mean, uh, we just had in Kansas uh, past campus carry. I think the stupid thing that we, that, that we still have clinging on is, is you can't carry in hospitals, but I, other than that, I really don't have any complaints. So I'm just going to sit here and like be horrified while you guys tell your stories. But I mean, I, I just see a shift. Some some states are going for more freedom and some are going for less. And I don't I mean, it has to do with the uh, government, I'm sure. But um, also, I'm sure the activists as well. I, I mean, the squeaky squeaky tire gets the uh, gets the oil. So, I, you know, I think that I'm a little ashamed of myself from sitting here and just being fat, dumb and happy and not having to worry about things, not having to worry about things. I haven't been as active as I should be because I haven't, I haven't had any real fights to fight yet. So mm-hmm. thank you for what you guys are doing. Yeah. Well, George, I, we don't really have a whole lot. Oh, sorry, Mike. You want to no, go ahead? I, yeah. I was going to make a point there on okay. Kansas uh, made somewhat made news, I guess recently, but so Kansas has a law essentially saying that any product made and mm-hmm. sold and owned in Kansas is not subject to the second amendment. Well, Some people may know, but a soldier uh, essentially purchased a non-registered silencer and then didn't go through the NFA process to put it on the NFA registry, uh, was arrested and uh, basically went up through the appellate court system. And a couple weeks ago now, the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. So essentially what that did was make that Kansas law null. So they, that law may be on the books, but if it's not being held up federally and the soldier's still being pro- prosecuted under federal law, well, then what good is that law? So um, even if, you know, states like Kansas are trying to move in that direction, it's always important to remember that the federal government plays a role as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, in Georgia, we don't have a whole lot of stuff going on, really. Um, you know, we're usually pretty gun-friendly state for the most part, but, you know, with the recent influx in the past decade or so of, a lot of folks from out west, um, you know, California ice and such as that. I mean, coming here and, you know, Georgia is kind of now known as like Little Hollywood or East Coast Hollywood. Um, we've got a lot of liberal mindset here, just anti gun mindset uh, kind of coming into the state. And we've seen a kind of a swing in the, you know, poli- uh, the political realm a little bit in the state. Uh, we still are, you know, red leaning, you know, pro freedom and such. Um, we just passed campus carry. I think it was, I think it went into effect last year, or the year before. I don't recall, but there's uh, some anti gun bills in the House and in the state right now. Uh, one to repeal that, one to restrict 3D printed guns, um, one to require training on carry permit applications and such. And we are a uh, shall issue state here. A few other odds and ends, nothing really too crazy going on here in Georgia, pretty much par for the course, but it's still. It's not something that we just sit idly by and just let happen. You know, we don't get complacent here. We still contact our reps, and if we need to go to the Capitol building, we go, and we meet with our reps, and we discuss things and just in that sort of uh, in that sort of light. But, you know, it's just I think in the coming years, probably the next couple of decades, we're going to see a swing into becoming a battleground state, you know, much like Ohio and Florida are. Um, we've already heard talk of that in the past presidential election, you know, about Georgia kind of getting that status which is not really something that's admirable, in my opinion. I don't want to be a battleground state here in Georgia. Yeah. You look at how you know um, close the governor's race was, that, that should speak for itself right there. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I'll just quickly mention, I know we have to move on, but I will say that we also just got uh, air gun hunting for big game legalized in Georgia. So you can now use uh, big game air rifles, uh, you know, heavy, big caliber, high-powered air rifles to hunt deer now. Wow. Because I know here in Colorado, you can't even shoot a BB gun within, you know, the city limits. You'll get in trouble for it. So, or an air gun, anything. We're going to take a quick break and talk about Q. So, Mike, I saw that recently you were shooting the Sugar Weasel, which I have not had a chance to shoot yet, but it looks really cool. I did, however, recently shoot the Fix, and I took it to 630 yards, which to the average long distance shooter, it doesn't sound like a lot. But for me, because I don't have any experience shooting long range, I'm learning everything as I go. 
This is to date the farthest that I've shot. If you guys want to check out that video, go to my YouTube channel, Ava Flannell. Otherwise, I was really happy with the performance and I'm hoping to see, you know, I'm hoping my next video will be a thousand yards and then I'm going to see how far I could take it after that. So if you guys want to check out the fix or any of Q's products, go to liveqordie.com. So Colorado actually used to be very much like a red state. And in July 1st, 2013, they passed where you can't have a magazine that exceeds 15 rounds, which is really stupid because nobody enforces it. I mean, even law enforcement said they're not going to enforce it because there's no way. You know, magazines aren't serialized. So who's to say that, that you got it before or after July 1st of 2013? But then recently, just a few months ago, they did pass a red flag law, which will go into effect January 1st. And I mean, that's extremely alarming. So I think if anything, Colorado is the perfect example of, you know, it's been a red state for years. And now suddenly there's just all these people moving here and it's definitely kind of shifting. So it's important that you guys don't, you know, that nobody stays complacent. And I do appreciate what you guys do. It's nice because you have a large audience. So you guys can like voice your opinion because I think a lot of people don't take the time to educate themselves on what's going on. Like, you know, the gun laws and stuff. And a lot of times it's just passed right underneath their noses and they don't even realize it. It happens a lot. A lot of people just don't pay attention to what's going on. And, you know, sometimes they don't have time or whatever the case is. And, I mean, we just try to do that service and get the message out there to folks who may not know and get them, you know, motivated to maybe spread the word. Mm-hmm. You know? but yeah. I, yeah. I was going to say a perfect example of that was over a year ago, I did a video on the California law with the ammo ID card thing. I don't live in California. I have no intention of ever going to California, but the, uh, I did it as a service to the people there. And then, uh, you know, to let them know this is coming, like get ready in whatever way you choose to get ready. Six months ago, I did a Facebook Live video on it. And then, you know, June 30th or whatever, I posted something on my Facebook page, like say, hey guys, like today's the last day or, or 29th, whatever it was. And like, people are like, I never heard of this. What? And I was like, guys. I don't know, get it. We can only do, like we, us, this community can only do what we can do. People have to do their part as well. Yeah. Are there any 2A wins that you guys want to talk about? Not just in your area, but just throughout the U.S.? <laughs> Right now, not many. I know. there. Are, I mean, there's still, like, I know that there's a, there's a few states where now, you know, it's you can carry without having to take a class. You don't have to apply for yeah. a permit. I mean, but it's still on a state level, though. The constitutional carry, that's a bill we've got here in Georgia that's just being introduced and going through the legislature, which, you know, hopefully will become a constitutional carry state in the future. But um, the state of the 2A, as far as on a federal level, has been a little dismal, you know. So, um, on, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Last question, because I know everyone's busy and I'm not going to keep you. Um, what's the funniest thing that you did as a kid that your parents still talk about to this day? I, I, uh, I went to a local store that sold chickens and I stole six chickens, <laughs> put Vaseline all over them, let them go in high school. <laughs> they still talk about that. Wait, they wait. might they might take your gun permit for that, man. <laughs> <laughs> they were wait, not easy to catch. Wait, they were not easy to catch. Live live chickens. Are you an animal rights activist or something? What's going on? I just put Vaseline on my feet. It'd be funny watching the teachers trying to catch them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's pretty dang funny. Yeah, Actually, got suspended for five days. Nice. That actually Wait, reminds me of something that I'd forgotten about until now, but my my parents, they decided to have like put in like a big man-made pond and they wanted to buy a bunch of, well, they bought a bunch of um, ducks and swans and geese. And I, when I was little, I forget, maybe this is like when I was like around five years old, but I got mad at my mom. So I took a loaf of bread and I put just a bunch of little pieces of bread from outside going into the house and all the birds ended up coming inside the house <laughs> and my mom like could not get rid of them. Like every time she's like trying to shoo them, they're getting scared. They're flying everywhere. There was like, Oh, it was a nightmare. But I forgot about that actually until just That's now. Pretty good. Yeah. Well, mine's not very funny, but my mom just reminded me of it the other day. But when I was a kid, I was probably in, I don't know, fifth grade. And uh, about that time when you start realizing you might need glasses. So we're just, driving from my town up to the, the town north of us where I went to school and there was a big farm on the right side of the road, the big old pecan trees and stuff in this one big grove and a big nice brick house. I looked over and I thought there was a herd of 
dogs in this field. I'm like, oh, my God, look at all those dogs. Well, they weren't dogs. They were goats. And that was the moment that my mother realized that I probably needed glasses. So the next trip we had was to the optometrist. But she just reminded me of that about two weeks ago, and we had a we had a ball laughing about that. I got one, I guess, since I'll go. So I was a Boy Scout, and um, growing up, this is, you know, before Oklahoma City and all that stuff made it, like, a big deal. So we used to make bombs, like, little night, uh, fertilizer bombs out of, like, mm-hmm. toilet paper rolls and stuff, like homemade firecrackers. That's how we mm-hmm. looked at them. And this was just normal behavior for us, my right. brother and I. So I went to Boy Scout camp because I was – probably 12 i guess however old you have to be to go to boys to be in boy scouts so i went to boy scout camp and i was showing all the kids how to make them and at night like when when uh, you know it got dark out we all just like lit them all at once and it just sounded like i don't know incoming orders or something so all the adults came running out you know and they're like what the heck's going on and so i was like yeah i just showed everybody how to make these explosives and they're like, <laughs> they're like what? <laughs> they're like what you know they freaked out and uh i got kicked out they called my dad and my dad to come get me next morning and oh I was, man i was never in boy scouts again I, I don't have any funny stories about myself in fact i called my mom and i was like mom can you remember anything funny that is kind of like an inside joke with our family now and she she couldn't think of anything i i thought of one stupid thing and then she thought of one kind of ironic thing and the stupid thing that I thought of was um, the nickname that my dad gave me. It's just a stupid nickname. But anyways, I've never told anybody, but it was a uh, Coringa mini pants, which that doesn't, that's the stupidest <laughs> name ever. So there you go. That's embarrassing. And um, then my mom said, when we were growing up, we were four kids and uh, we were very sheltered. We weren't allowed to watch cartoons or, you know, it, PG, like she had to watch the PG movies first before we could watch them. And so she, because she had read an article, she said she read an article that if you let the kids watch cartoons, uh, they'll be seven times more likely to, to be violent or something like that. She's like, no cartoons, no, no toy guns, no nothing. Like we didn't have like squirt guns or anything. And uh, she just thought it was ironic that I grew up to, to shoot guns because we never had guns growing up in the house, even toy guns. So that was lame. Sorry. I, I wish I had a chicken around. The, I wish I had a greased chicken story. But I was, too good. I was just a, a goody two shoes. I never did anything bad. I, I also crazy glued all the locks in the school, and they had to take acetylene torches to open the doors the following day. Oh my god! I got in a shit ton of trouble for that, but it was so funny. One time there was this girl that I didn't like, so I put when she was sleeping, I put tanning lotion, like sunless tanning lotion, on her nose, so it would turn brown. And I told everyone she was a brown noser. <laughs> And that's not coming off either. <laughs> I know. Exactly. <laughs> you got to do nair on the eyebrows. Yeah, I know. Oh, Eric left. Oh, no, he didn't. No, I'm here. What about you, Jeremy? Yeah, so, so, um, one, one night, my, my stepbrother and I thought that it would be fun to take uh, this, like, 99 Ford Festiva. And, we'd, and we might have been, I don't know, maybe 17, 16, 17 years old. We took this Ford Festiva and we went over to the local uh, golf course. All right. And we were jumping the sand dunes in this Festiva. And I ain't kidding. I looked down and one of those sand dunes we jumped, I think we were going about 65 miles an hour. It's pretty sketchy. And then proceeded to go falling down the back roads on the dirt roads. And we were handbraking the corner, handbrake, back the turn because we had that Festiva going like 70 miles an hour. We ended up cracking the radiator, and then the head gasket was blown because yeah, we 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 completely trashed that car. It was pretty epic. Yeah. Pretty wow. Oh yeah. Oh no. Oh, fire. A real a real portrait of responsibility. This one here. I don't know. The fire shoes with your brother was pretty funny too. Yeah, we, we did set our shoes on fire inside of a Taco Bell one night. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All these stories make me realize I'm kind of glad I don't have kids right now. (laughs) We're going to take another break and talk about Sharps Bros. I'm really excited because John Sharps, the owner of Sharps Bros, he's going to trigger con. So I'm going to finally meet him face to face. If you guys aren't familiar with his products, which you probably are, you just aren't familiar with maybe the name. He makes all of those really nice lowers that are really unique. Um, 
the Jack, the Warthog, the Hellbreaker. So any of those things that have like that, that nice unique shape to it, like the skull, which is, you know, referred to as the Jack. He is the originator of those. And I think it gives it a really unique look and it's perfect for any AR-15 build. And the best part about it all is all of these lowers are under $300. So head on over to sharpsbros.com and tell them that I said hello. All right. And then wrapping up, do you guys, anybody have any cool future plans? Immediate future? Or I mean, long term? Anything. <laughs> no, survive my children. That's that's my plan. <laughs> It's a good plan. If I if I don't die before my youngest graduates high school from a series of many strokes, I'll be very surprised. In the near term, in the near term future, I don't know if you guys can see it, but there is a Black Hawk helicopter hovering over my house right now. So, oh yeah, <laughs> coming for you. Yeah, they're always tracking me. At least in my head, they are. Right. <laughs> All we got to do. <laughs> he said uh what did he say all they have to do is look for that bald head of yours <laughs> right. mr mr clean baby exactly we're gonna take one last break and talk about polymer 80 john i know that polymer 80 sponsors you i've seen some of the guns that you've made which are really impressive and that's what i love about polymer 80 is you can make a very basic looking gun or you could take it to the next level add a bunch of new components and make it look like a competition gun. Um, so really the options are endless. If you guys want to go and check out, make your own gun, go to polymer80.com, use the code gunfunny and that gets you 10% off. Karen, do you have any future plans? Yeah. Um, next week I'll be in DC. Uh, then I'll be in uh, Minnesota, Minnesota for USPSA, um, Nebraska for USPSA the weekend after that. Uh, tactical games. So I'll be doing two of the tactical games, one in South Carolina and one in North Carolina in August and November, I think is the second one. So I will be training my butt off for that and uh, getting more involved in the fitness kind of not market, but getting getting more into fitness. Nice. uh, Taking an AK course um, from Center T official training. And that will be in uh, Sparta, Illinois. And uh, I think it's put on by Saber Works and Tactical Shit. So I'm looking forward to that. I, I, I will be um, at the uh, games, tactical games in North Carolina. So I will see you then. Awesome. Very cool. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you joining me for episode 100. I appreciate your time. And happy birthday, Ava. Oh, thank you. Thanks for wearing oh, happy birthday. Awesome. You look really good for 100. Oh, thanks. Thanks for wearing a prom dress, by the way. I didn't. I was going, well, I was going to wear a prom dress, but then um, I got my, my, you know, uh, time zones mixed up yeah. and I had seven minutes. It's all right. It's more cool. time, so. No worries. You don't have to. That's, that's what dry shampoo is made for, by the way. That's why I was in. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times that stuff's come in handy. <laughs> oh gosh. Awesome. Mike, you, you can't relate. It's all right. Right, Mike? I mean, no, no, I take that shine away. John Snow right. knows. He knows. All right. We are going to wrap up. So if you guys want to find me on social media or where the podcast is located, we also have a store. Uh, you can find all of that at gunfunny.com. If you can't get enough of the show, you should consider becoming a Patreon. A dollar gets you access to our Patreon only Facebook page. Five dollars gets you entered into a monthly raffle uh, to win really cool stuff. And your Patreon donation, it goes entirely back to the show. Um, it allows me to afford a editor who is Kenny Ortega. So if you think the show sounds better, that's because I have an editor. Um, it's also allowing me to go to TriggerCon at the end of the month because of your guys' pledges, I can afford that trip. I also want to thank our $25 Patreons who are Corbin Bonafide, Iraq Veteran 8888, oh hey, Charger Arms, Ryan Morrison, Kevin Breddingham, Michael Alexio, and Silencer Shop. And our king of the Patreon is still Jon Snow. So if you want to outthrone him, all you have to do is pledge $101. But until then, it is still Jon Snow. And he wants me to say, the pen is mightier than the sword, but only if the pen is held by Operator Tickles. And if you guys don't follow Tickles, that's my dog. You can find her on Instagram at Tactickles. 
And uh, in order to become a Patreon, just go to patreon.com forward slash gun funny and join us in that Facebook group. And then lastly, I'm doing a tech pack giveaway once a month. In order to enter that giveaway, all you have to do is go to gunfunny.com forward slash TP as in tech pack, enter your first name, your email address, and every month I draw a lucky winner. Otherwise, if you want to just go on over and get your tech pack, which is a monthly subscription box, it's go to tackpack.com, enter the code gunfunny, and you will receive a free SOG tool with your first box. All right, guys. I want to thank everyone for joining me and for making this episode special. All right, we are out of here. Want to send feedback? Tell us about a company or anything else. Go to gunfunny.com forward slash contact. <laughs>